Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, Ottawa promises to fund First Nations search for unmarked graves. It should be solely their responsibility because of the devastation brought. Plus, demands for action, accountability and answers from the Catholic Church. Also tonight, Ontario's controversial final answer, keeping millions of kids home until the fall. These aren't risks I'm willing to take. Sparking worries about who's left behind. They need to reconnect, they need to re-engage. They're not meant to be socially isolated. Plus, an old sport, a young star. A Canadian fencing phenom on her way to the Olympics gives us a tour of her sport, including the secret behind the fencing screen. And I want to ask you each how you want the Tragically Hip to be remembered. The Tragically Hip as they get ready for their first show since bidding farewell to their front man. This is The National. This country is having a moment of reckoning after a B.C. First Nation made a stunning announcement last week that a preliminary scan found hundreds of remains near a residential school. Now the chorus of voices calling for accountability, action and answers is growing. Much of what is being called for, the blueprint to accountability, was laid out in recommendations made by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission exactly six years ago today. 94 calls to action designed to account for past wrongs. Well, work has begun on many. According to a CBC tracking project, just 10 are fully implemented. Today, addressing recommendations made around the burials of children, federal ministers pledged access to financial support. But as Olivia Stefanovic shows us, some, including a former Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner, say it is all moving too slowly. This is the area we want to have explored. The task immense, but the determination greater. We want to make sure if we find those kind of uh, remains, if you will, that we want to make sure that proper protocols, the proper connections to the communities of the families that, you know, that uh, were connected here. Chief Michael Starr of Star Blanket Cree Nation wants to search the grounds of the residential school his father was forced to attend. As soon as he arrived, his hair was cut. And whenever he tried to speak his language, he was hurt. Starr says he believes there could be children buried on these grounds of the former Quapel Indian Residential School, just like in Kamloops. And he wants Ottawa to pay to find out. It should be solely their responsibility because of the devastation brought. In the name of the Father. In 2019, the federal government set aside more than $30 million to respond to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. Recommendations specifically related to missing children and burial grounds. We will be there for all communities. Two years later, the ministers say communities can start applying for money now. We are walking at the pace of communities. A former Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner says the government needs to be moving faster. We heard an old man, for example, tell us that he used to see children burying children. Wilton Littlechild supports a demand from the UN Human Rights Office calling for investigations into the deaths of Indigenous children and the missing. He used to always have an empty chair beside him during hearings to represent those who never came home. And he worries the recommendations will go unfinished. And there's no body uh, in Canada that monitors what Canada is doing to follow up on those recommendations. So consequently, nothing gets done. So Olivia, given all of that, what is the government saying about that UN call for an investigation? Adrian, the government is not committing to a probe into the deaths and the disappearance of Indigenous children from residential schools. Instead, the ministers say it's up to Indigenous communities to decide what's best for themselves. The government says it's spent the last year consulting with Indigenous communities. But Chief Michael Starr, who we just heard from, says he wasn't aware of any engagement process. Still, he plans to apply for this newly available funding to search for burial grounds in the hope his community can find closure. Adrian? Indeed. Olivia Stefanovic. Thank you, Olivia. 
Now, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission also called for action from the Catholic Church. The revelations out of Kamloops have left some of the millions of Catholics in Canada angry and soul-searching about the harm done to Indigenous people under the banner of their faith. Briar Stewart now with the calls for atonement from within the church. Skaga Kane is a deacon in the Catholic Church and a member of the Squamish First Nation who knows plenty about the horrors of residential schools. But what's emerged from Kamloops is still infuriating. That makes me angry. I still keep my faith. The majority of residential schools were run by the Catholic Church, but it's the only one where top officials haven't apologized for its role. And today experts say some Catholic organizations are obstructing efforts to find unmarked burials and identify children by withholding thousands of historical records. There is a responsibility that lies squarely on the shoulders of the Council of Bishops of Canada. Some feel it should rest even higher. One of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, a papal apology never offered. The revelations from Kamloops led to the creation of this online group for Catholics struggling with the institution. I just felt frustrated that this story is still ongoing and people are not feeling they've had the, you know, the response that we've wanted to see from the church sometimes. The broader Christian community is also grappling with some of those questions. Daryl de Klerk was drawn to the Kamloops Memorial by grief and guilt. While not Catholic, the pastor says the lack of accountability is inexcusable. As Christians, we apologize to God every day for all kinds of things. And so I want the church to offer an unequivocal, heartfelt apology. Back in St. Paul's Indian Church, Gaga Kane says he will persevere. Despite my thoughts on Kamloops, I am still a member of the church and I need to find ways to help them. You can see the long house Which is the why during his services, he tries to, to the, incorporate uh, indigenous language and culture, something residential schools try to erase. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. This is a traumatizing time for many people who went to residential schools or who are affected by them. And there is support available through the National Indian Residential School Crisis Line. You can access emotional and crisis referral services by calling the 24-hour number on your screen. A Quebec inquiry came to a close today with the coroner promising the death of Joyce Eshaquan will not be in vain. She is the Indigenous woman who recorded hospital staff making derogatory remarks as she lay dying. As Alison Northcott explains, the inquiry laid bare what many already believe. Quebec health care is plagued by systemic racism. After 13 days of often emotional testimony, as the inquiry came to an end, a huge crowd made its way to the courthouse in trois -Rivières. It's really important to support uh, our nation, our people, and uh, we believe in the justice. The inquiry heard Eshaquan had gone to the hospital with stomach pains. At one point, she became agitated and was restrained, but she wasn't properly monitored, so staff didn't notice her condition deteriorating. She died of a pulmonary edema linked to heart failure, but one expert testified she could have been saved. Je ne vous mentirai pas. Eshaquan's family made a statement through a spokesperson to mark the end of the hearings they say were overwhelming. Ce que je peux vous dire maintenant et que nous avons un certain soulagement à l'effet que nous avons pu vous raconter ne serait-ce qu'une infime partie l'histoire de Joyce. The family's lawyer says the inquiry showed Eshaquan's care was tainted by racism and discrimination. There is the, a problem of systemic racism that uh, influenced the way that she was treated. And uh, the second thing, of course, are severe shortcomings in terms of the way that the emergency room was managed. A lawyer for the health authority said it has made changes since Eshaquan's death as it tries to build trust with the Atikamekw community. Some in that community have said they avoid going to the hospital. Ça fait des années que ça dure. And Leeds Dubé says Eshaquan's story is just one example why. As hearings wrapped up, calls once again for the government to recognize systemic racism in Quebec, something Premier Francois Legault has repeatedly refused to do. The coroner thanked Eshaquan's family for their courage and strength and said she hopes her final report can be the foundation of a social pact to prevent this from happening again. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Trois-Rivières, Quebec. 
Tomorrow, Ottawa releases its response to the final report from the National Inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Today, a group made up of surviving family members presented its contributions to the effort. This is sacred work. It's not easy work. It's difficult. Um, it is. Um, it wears on your spirit, but we do it because um, we all lost someone. The National Family and Survivor Circle was established last summer, one of many groups working on ways to address violence against Indigenous women and girls. Its contribution identifies 30 ways to help. Let's turn to the COVID story now. Across the country, the tone from public health officials is definitely different these days. Cautious optimism and sunny predictions about a more normal summer ahead. One reason why, of course, the daily case count. This is Canada's pandemic. First wave, second wave, and now coming off the third. The trend is pretty clear. And even Ontario, which consistently drives these numbers, is now seeing its lowest daily case rate so far this year. But problem is, that's still currently around 1,000 new cases a day. And that was a factor in today's controversial decision to keep Ontario students out of classrooms for the rest of the school year. Deanna Sumanak Johnson shows us what that means for COVID, for parents, and for kids. So today, I have to announce that schools will not be returning for in-class learning until the fall. This was not the news Layla Coulter wanted to hear. I think it's really an awful decision. The mother of four had even started a petition hoping to avert the decision. Our kids here in Thunder Bay have been out of school. Their last day was February 26th. Um, so it's been really hard. So many families are struggling. In Ontario hotspots like Thunder Bay or Toronto, kids have spent more than four months, that's almost a half of this school year, out of physical classrooms. Compare that to British Columbia, where only a few dozen schools closed at all, and even then, only for two weeks. Or Quebec City, one of that province's hotspots, where elementary schools were closed for six weeks and high schools for 10 weeks. More than one student in the chat after seeing the news today was like, I'm done, I can't do online. And, and as much as I want them to, to try and persevere and show that resilience, I completely understand them. This infectious diseases specialist says that even a few weeks of learning in person would have helped teachers identify potential problems. How are they doing from their nutrition? How are they doing uh, from a, pr a perspective of possible abuse? Also, it would have been a really important check-in to gauge how they're doing even educationally. But some experts think the spread of variants justifies a cautious approach. And I think our focus at this point in time is really uh, trying to make sure that we continue to limit contact interactions through whatever measures are possible. And for this Ottawa father, keeping schools closed is a fair trade-off, giving his two daughters a shot at a better summer. Realistically, to give them that two or three weeks as opposed to just giving them the freedom to socialize in their neighbourhoods all summer long, I think that the choice is obvious. Ontario students will also be able to have in-person graduations outdoors for every grade, a dash of normality to cap off a school year that was anything but. Deanna Sumanak johnson CBC News, Toronto. In Nova Scotia, which just over a month ago was hit by a sudden surge of COVID unlike anything it had seen so far, there were today tentative steps towards reopening. Schools outside of the Halifax and Sydney areas opened, along with restaurant patios province-wide. We're making it. We're on our way. <laughs> <laughs> but the Premier sounded a note of caution with no date yet on relaxing border restrictions. I understand you want some clarity and certainty, but with COVID, nothing is for sure. Newfoundland, meanwhile, does have a plan for easing borders. It's called Together Again. And that's exactly what it does. If it hits benchmarks for vaccination rates and infections remain low, travelers will be allowed to enter the province without quarantine by Canada Day. Well, battered by the third wave, Manitobans are undoubtedly looking for anything to take their minds off the pandemic. And tonight, for a few hours, they had it. A real contrast in how these two teams get. Game one of the Northern Division final is over in Winnipeg. The Habs did win, but even so, the Jets have been a ray of hope for the province. And tonight, as Cameron McIntosh shows us, for the first time in 15 months, they played in front of hometown fans. Hello, thank you. From the front lines to seats between the blue lines, they don't need tickets. You have your home, sir, home card, you have your 
just ID cards and proof of vaccination. 500 healthcare workers. I'm uh, proud and excited and uh, fortunate to be here. Fully vaccinated, socially distanced, the Winnipeg whiteout, pandemic version. I'm a huge Jets fan. I was just so lucky to be one of the lucky chosen ones. Now, normally during a home playoff game, these streets would be closed. Thousands of people would be downtown clad in white. But with a test positivity rate in Winnipeg of 13% right now, gatherings are banned. Unlike the full arenas in the U.S. or even the 2,500 in Montreal, after beating Edmonton in an empty rink, Tonight's crowd, just 3% capacity. Management hopes eventually for many others. The idea is this is an opportunity to showcase what you can do when you get a vaccination. That's how the Premier is selling it too. And I think we should take that as a sign of some small amount of optimism that we can start to get our lives back here in Manitoba. But with critical COVID patients still being flown out of province to receive care, some in health care question this. The nurses union telling members to use their judgment in signing up for tickets. Others see this as a well-earned reprieve. It's really great to see that we are being honoured in this way. Last round, Toronto tried something similar. It didn't work out so well. Still, Jets players are keen on it. Just any fans in general is, is, is awesome. It's great to see that we'll have, uh, we'll have some fans in the building. Nurse Teresa Jensen hopes sooner rather than later. I'm hoping that one day soon we're going to be out of this and most of Winnipeg can have a chance to come watch the Jets and cheer them on. Still, with Manitoba's COVID numbers, a full whiteout is unlikely, even if the Jets go all the way. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. In BC, the battle to preserve an old growth forest is raging and protesters are not backing down. Over the past few weeks, police have been trying to clear multiple blockades at the Ferry Creek watershed on Vancouver Island. That's an unlogged area with trees up to 800 years old. Greg Rasmussen was there today as protesters continued to defy orders to leave. This woman has buried her hands in the ground beneath this logging road, encased in concrete. I tied myself into this tube in the ground and so I'm kind of stuck here until they get me out, basically. <laughs> Her goal is to stop loggers from getting access to old growth trees. This is so important. This is crucial. This is not replaceable. RCMP personnel are tasked with removing the protesters. Here is a structure that um, some of the protesters have made. It's a, an enormous log that they've um, obviously salvaged from around here. What we can see here is that they have put inside there a piece of metal. And then around that, they've put concrete. And then she's either holding on to chain or she's actually chained. It's a shame that it has to come to this. I don't want to be strapped to a log, but it's, it's really hard that we have to be doing this. The variety of obstacles spread out over multiple locations makes it a slow process to remove them. On a quick look, it can seem like we're a bunch of dirty hippies, you know, just kicking it out in the woods, trying to, trying to prevent people from doing their jobs. But it's so much, it's so much more than that. They dropped someone in the tree. He's in the tree above me. This protester spent eight nights on a platform 60 meters up an old growth cedar tree in the path of the logging. The entire set was shaking. All the tarps were coming apart. RCMP officers descended from a helicopter and arrested her. I think the only like truly fearful point I had was when that helicopter was right above my sit. It was really not at a safe distance. I did not know what was going to happen in that moment. Released from custody, she's pledged to keep up the fight. Until old growth logging stops, until we start to have more respect for the land and respect for the people of the land, this isn't going to go anywhere. Old growth logging opponents say hundreds more are willing to be arrested. So in the end, what you have is a very determined group of people up against a police force intent on enforcing this injunction. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, near Port Renfrew, B.C. Five years after the Tragically Hip played their final gig with frontman Gore Downey, they are being recognized for more than their music. I got to your house this morning. The band speaks about grief and loss before being honored at this week's Juno Awards. I still wish it wasn't over, you know what I mean? Then the emotions start kicking in, yeah. you know, you kind of realize it's like, yeah, that was it. 
plus at 15. Jessica Guo is a fencing phenom and heading to her first Olympics. She speaks with me about the strategy behind the sport, including the scream. Once you go to competition, you should scream. But first, an exclusive CBC News investigation uncovers repeated violations at some Ontario long-term care homes. Why is this continuing to happen? Where is the accountability? We're back in two. Welcome back. A follow-up to a CBC News investigation. A year ago, our colleagues at Marketplace investigated repeated violations at some Ontario long-term care homes. Now, even after the pandemic brought increased attention to long-term care, CBC News has found continuing instances of abuse and infection prevention violations. Here's Ellen Morrow. Abuse. Physical abuse. Physical injury to the resident. Vaughn and Mary know exactly what that abuse can look like. They secretly recorded Vaughn's mother being victimized at Craigley Nursing Home in 2019. She passed away later that year. She's in a better place. She can't be hurt no more. So this is from uh, March 1st. We show them a report from just three months ago detailing another abuse violation at Craigley. Reading that, just I can see it and I'm so scared for that person. Why is this continuing to happen? Where is the accountability? Despite a history of abuse, Craig Lee has never faced tough punishment from the province. Few homes ever do. There's no tolerance whatsoever for, for negligence or abuse. But a CBC News analysis from last fall found 85% of Ontario's long-term care homes repeatedly break the law with nearly no consequences. It's still happening. It's like nothing's changed. We show Kathy Parks reports from November and April listing infection prevention violations at Orchard Villa. Her father was one of 70 residents to die in COVID outbreaks at the home. Even after that, inspectors found several violations. Staff going in and out of residents' rooms without PPE, not washing their hands. What's your reaction seeing those reports that we showed you? I think there's a level of comfort in knowing that there's no repercussions. It's heartbreaking. It really is heartbreaking. Southbridge, the company that owns Craigley and Orchard Villa, insists it has zero tolerance for neglect. The Craigley staff member in that March abuse report has been disciplined, Southbridge says, and it defended Orchard Villa's infection prevention measures. They don't even have to pay a fine. If I park my car in the wrong spot, I'll get a parking ticket. And without stronger penalties from the province, Vaughn and Mary say the violations will only continue. Nothing's going to change. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. That feeling, they say, makes their loss even harder to bear. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Members of the Tragically Hip are remembering Gore Downey five years since we last heard him sing. Right after this, in an interview with Q's Tom Power, how they have coped with the enormous loss. Uh, well, you know, if you press all your grief or anger or whatever, you, you bottle it all up, it's going to come out sometime. Plus, their newly uncovered music and who they're jamming with at this weekend's Juno Awards. Next. So hard to forget this, that night in August, five years ago, when the Tragically Hip performed their last concert with frontman Gore Downey in Kingston, Ontario. This weekend, at the Junos, they will take the stage again for the first time since Downey died. The band is also being presented with the Junos Humanitarian Award to honour their music and philanthropy. They've raised millions of dollars for various social and environmental causes over the years. It has been a long run for this iconic Canadian band, and their return to the stage is sure to be an emotional moment. Tom Power, host of Q on CBC Radio 1, recently had a chance to talk with the hip about that, their newly released music and their remarkable legacy. The last time these guys were all on stage together, it was a national moment. Gord Downey's final performance with the Tragically Hip broadcast live across the country. 
For Canadians, it was the chance to say goodbye. For the hip, it was the end of a long journey. From indie band to national icons. Now, almost five years later, the remaining members of the band continue to build on their legacy. We were recently treated to some newly released hit music, recordings that had been presumed lost in a fire. And this weekend, the band will be performing with Feist as part of the Juno celebrations. Lots to talk about when I sat down with them earlier this week. We started with that farewell show of 2016. The last time I saw you guys all on stage together was, of course, at your concert in Kingston. But I'll start, Johnny, with you. What do you remember from that night? Well, for me, it was a little like being in a spaceship. You know, we were all in that room together. Everyone was observing what was going on. It was a pretty heavy moment, but you still got to play the gig. You know, you still got to go over the songs in your, in your brain. But there were moments that were just, you know, they were totally crazy. And then moments that were just... Uh, you know, we're, we're playing our last few notes as a band and soaking in. Paul, how about you? Like, what do you remember from the night? Well, it was a night that meant a lot to a lot of people. Uh, it's just a kind of a feeling of uh, luckiness and, and just uh, happiness for Gord that he was able to achieve that. Rob, what was it like after that when you went backstage? Uh, it was pretty surreal. The whole thing was very surreal for me. I'm good at uh, compartmentalizing my emotions. And I tried as much as possible to treat it like uh, just another day at the office. Yeah. Uh, because we had a job to do. Uh, and then when it was over, uh, I sat down and had a really nice conversation with Gord. Just we chatted for about 20 minutes. It was very kind of quiet and tender. And then it's the work day is over. Clean out your desk. Go home. There's no gold watch. <laughs> Away you go. You're done. Yeah. Re I'm, now I'm retired. And you go home and you think, I, I can deal with all this. It got pretty weird for me. I got, you know, I was messed up after the fact. I thought I was good going into it. And when it was all done, I thought I was good. But it, was, it got hard. How do you mean? Uh, well, you know, if you press all your grief or anger or whatever, if you, you bottle it all up, it's going to come out sometime, and it gets messy. Right. Gord, last word to you here on this. What were you feeling? I mean, after the concert, the day after the concert? We started off the whole tour out in Victoria really not knowing if we were going to get through the first show, let alone the whole tour. And then by the time we got to Kingston, we all got so buoyed by the audience every night. You know, he would drop a line and the crowd would sing along. You know, he got better. Like, I honestly believe he got better and better. And the band got better and better. And, and yeah, I just didn't want it to ever end. You know, I, I really didn't. I still wish it wasn't over. You know what I mean? Then the emotions start kicking in. Yeah. You know, you kind of realize it's like, yeah, that was it. That was it. The snow is so merciless. Montreal. It's been really great to hear you guys again on the Saskadelphia recordings. Um, what a relief to yes. think that you had lost these recordings. Yeah. This took two years to get to this point. Yeah. You know, of searching, finding out what was in the fire. It's taken two years to get these six songs. Rob, what was it like to hear this again for the first time? It was pretty incredible, actually. Uh, what really got me was uh, hearing Gord's voice talking between songs. And, uh, you know, I'm listening with headphones on and suddenly he's in my head talking. And it was, uh, there were a few times where I just had to like stop it and put it away and I'll come back to that in a week. What a response, hey? Like I was looking at um, even just Spotify before I came here to see the numbers for these, these songs, you know, in the hundreds of thousands doing incredibly well. Gord, what was it like to see the reception to this music from all these years ago? It's heartwarming and buoying at the same time. I went out for an early morning paddle in my canoe at my cottage and one of my neighbors said, hey, they were listening to your music up pretty late last night. And, and they were, you could hear it from across the lake. Someone had picked it up, you know. It means a lot that it means a lot to people. Got no fish and pop scars, ain't got no sugar nerves. My baby, she won't know me when I'm thinking about them, yeah. 
Sunday night at the Junos, the Tragically Hip are set to perform without Gore Downey for the first time. Feist will be taking the vocals. Gore, tell me how this came about to do this performance with Feist. Uh, the possibility of playing the Junos was tabled a little while back. Um, and frankly, we, none of us were super, super interested. You know, we just we hadn't played together and weren't really interested in playing without Gord. And then uh, Jake Gold, our manager, uh, suggested Feist uh, might step into Gord's shoes. And it was really the first time collectively we kind of all like stopped for a minute. It's like, wow, that's a, that's a pretty cool idea. Yeah, I mean, we had said we weren't going to, and now here we, here we are playing with Leslie. Yeah. Um, because that was such a, I mean, a curveball, like in, in the best way. Kind of like, okay, so that's not going to be some guy trying to sing like Gord or some yeah. guy trying not to sing like Gord. And we'll go out on one last question. I'll make it a tough one, and for each of you. Okay. I want to ask you each how you want the Tragically Hip to be remembered. You know, any artist wants their output to to not only endure, but actually mean something, hopefully uplift people, you know? Like, if we can do that, you know, for anybody, and, and Gord's words, you know, what more can you want as a legacy, I think? Yeah, I've given it a lot of thought lately. Just, you know, the, the band is going to live beyond us, you know, our music. And I think a little bit of what, you know, maybe we wanted to do is to honor Gord. And, you know, people ask questions about Gord, you know, what was he like? You know, what were the things he was writing about? Well, here's some stuff on Saskadelphia. Uh, that we were kind people. We tried hard. Isn't, isn't that enough? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like us to be remembered as a career band, a band that made a life of it. And even though Gord is gone far too soon, it wasn't like we had a six-year run. You know, we had a 32-year run. You know, it's obvious from how he's remembered with such love. He loved his band, the hip, and um, yeah, so I just hope we're remembered for our work ethic and our output. I love it. Guys, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, John. Lovely Great to talk time. to you. Thanks for making the time. That is just one part of Tom Power's interview with the Tragically Hip. The full version will air this Friday, June 4th on Q, 10 a.m. Eastern, 9 p.m., 9.30 Newfoundland time on CBC Radio 1. You can also catch it on the CBC Listen app. Gord Downey was also a passionate advocate for Indigenous rights, and in his solo work, Downey chronicled the life and death of a young boy who ran away from residential school and died. Chani Wenjak's terrible story all too common. And research shows the impact of the trauma can last for decades. It takes about five to six generations for an original trauma to be healed. Coming up, surviving abuse and its effects, not just on those who experienced it, but those who are born well after it happens. Stay with us. Welcome back. The report from a BC First Nation that hundreds of remains have been found on the grounds of a Kamloops residential school has brought renewed focus to the suffering of the Indigenous children forced to attend those schools. But that trauma is not theirs alone. It is shared by their children and grandchildren. And as Christine Birak explains, intergenerational trauma not only has emotional effects, but physical ones too. <laughs> So many didn't survive the abuse, but those who did likely never imagined their own children and grandchildren would inherit their unspeakable trauma. I don't have any recollection of my parents uh, as a child growing up at all. Back then, Adam North Pagan didn't know his parents were residential school survivors. Without role models, they struggled to raise children. When child services put them in foster care, the kids felt abandoned. That anger and that resentment that I bared towards my parents, you know, was very destructive. And it uh, led me down a road of, uh, you know, heavy, heavy, heavy drinking. In Canada, there's not a lot of understanding 
of why. Amy Bombay studies intergenerational trauma. She says people need to understand how abuse suffered decades ago is affecting Indigenous people today. We know that stress and trauma is bad at any time during your life, but it's particularly going to have long-lasting effects when it's happening early in life. To deal with stress, our body releases cortisol, which increases blood sugar. That energy boost can help us react in stressful situations. But childhood abuse can disrupt that stress response for life, leading to consistently high levels of cortisol, which can cause hypertension, diabetes, chronic pain, and heart attacks. Chronic stress also increases the risk of depression and mental illness while lowering resilience and immune function. This means taking risks. Psychologist Suzanne Stewart says it can all lead to a complex cycle of trauma, one that can play out over generations in the form of violence, addiction and poverty. It takes about five to six generations for an original trauma to be healed within a family or a group of people if it is not mediated by current ongoing traumas. My mom started to share with me stories about what had happened to her. North Pagan says those stories helped him unwind layers of trauma and systemic racism. He now raises awareness about Canada's history and hopes people will truly listen. We are good people. We're, we're just not, you know, uh, people out there that, uh, you know, experience social problems and, and addiction problems. There's reasons why, that, why that's going on. Echoes of pain from lives lost that for decades weren't acknowledged. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the Olympic Games in Tokyo just weeks away. And next, meet a Canadian teen who is dominating a centuries-old sport. A lot of people say like fencing is like a chess game. <laughs> but a much louder one, perhaps. My conversation with the fencing superstar Jessica Guo going to Tokyo next. Welcome back. In a sport where so many elite athletes are in their 20s or even 30s, Jessica Guo is an exception. She's just 15, the youngest member of Canada's fencing team heading to Tokyo this summer. But she is wise beyond her years, both in her devotion to her sport and her view of life beyond it. We sat down to chat at her fencing club in Markham, just north of Toronto. Fencing is one of those sports you've definitely seen before, but probably don't understand, beyond the fact that it's fast and old, very old. But this is a sport that is as 21st century as it gets, the highest tech event you will see at these Olympic Games. So, no surprise, one of its brightest stars... We have a new world champion... ...is among the youngest on Canada's Olympic team. Jessica, very nice yeah. to meet you. Hi. How are you feeling? Good, great today. How nervous are you? about the Olympics coming yes, up? Yes, very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I was talking to, uh, to uh, the owner here just a, a moment ago, yeah. and he was telling me that you basically get this whole place to yourself. Yeah, I do. Um, because of COVID, there's a lot less people coming in because of the restrictions. So I'm usually the only one here with like some of my teammates to train with and my coach. Yeah, he told yeah. me the whole place is closed yeah. except for Jessica. Yeah. <laughs> Just for me. <laughs> Jessica started fencing at age six. Before long, she was traveling the world competing. And in her age group, she's one of Canada's best. So. I've seen enough of you in competition to know that you're good. You're really yeah, thank good. thank you. <laughs> but I don't know enough about the sport to understand why you're so good. Oh. <laughs> what is it about you that, that makes you at, at this level? Well, a lot of people say like fencing is like a chess game, but moving. So I guess a lot of times is that you have to be able to kind of outsmart your opponent with your tactics and then that's how you're able to win but also using like endurance and strength that's a big part of it but most of it is like a mind game you know when i, when I was watching um some of your competitions actually i, I mean you hear the the, the, the weapons you hear yeah. the ting 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 yeah, ting ting yeah. but then every once in a while after a really intense back and forth one of the fencers will just scream 
like yeah. like one of these like a primal yeah. blood and I've heard you do that too. What's yeah. going on there? Um, well, a lot of times it's because you're very nervous and then you're trying to release like the nerves after getting a touch. But then also sometimes it's just to celebrate and being like, yay! Like after this long battle, like I'm it's, I got this amazing touch and you're just happy and celebrating. Are you taught to scream that way? Is yeah, that... a lot of beginners are taught to be, once you go to competition, you should scream and forcefully, sometimes the coaches be like, at this start of the match, the first few touches, just scream at any touch you get. And sometimes they'll be like, even if you don't, it's not your touch, you should scream. Because sometimes it actually convinces and persuades the ref in a kind of way to give you the touch. Sometimes it's, and if you call and if you scream, you're confident, so then they'll give the touch to you. And do you think about intimidating your opponents? Yeah, with that? yeah, it's very intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> what do your friends think? Do you feel like they, they get it? Like they, they understand all of the work that you're putting into and that they understand your sport? Um, I think they definitely know that I put in a lot of work into fencing because I travel so much, but I don't think they necessarily know how fencing works itself because they ask a lot of questions like, oh, like, can it go through you or like does it can you get impaled yeah <laughs> like how does that work so then i have to explain it to them but it's just very fun explaining it to them. we talked a little bit about tokyo yeah but what are your expectations in tokyo i don't have that many expectations but i really want to meddle with my team in team event and that would be very very exciting just to stand on the podium with the team and just to enjoy the moment but also individual medal would be great too. <laughs> You're also pretty young though. Yeah. Do you, you must think about the long game too, yeah, right? Yeah. Like it's not all about these games yeah, necessarily. Yeah. Um, so, like tell me, tell me a little bit about that, like your perspective going in. Well, I guess I obviously have long-term plans. So I guess for the first, this Tokyo Olympics, I'm just planning on getting the experience I need for like future Olympics if I want to do better and like kind of get the feel of how it works. For, to prepare myself for future Olympics, if I get in. <laughs> and are you thinking beyond Tokyo, but even beyond fencing, in terms of like what you want to study later or what kind of work you want to um, do? I do want to go into the med field, and I really want to be a surgeon, but I don't know yet. <laughs> it's, it does strike me that you're saying this in the middle of a pandemic. Yes. <laughs> has, that, has that changed the way you think? Um, there's been a lot of like deaths, obviously, and a lot of people are struggling. So I know that I do want to help people with these skills if I attend medical school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jessica, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Medals, attending medical school, like the future is hers. And, oh, yeah. and for all the anxiety about the Olympics, it's nice to hear that joy. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's joy. She is nervous sure. as heck. Uh, about, I mean, who wouldn't be, right, about going to the Olympics in Tokyo? And it's true, you know, the, the Olympics will be very different, but these will be her first games, right? So these are the Olympics by which she will judge all other Olympics, <laughs> and, and it sounds like there are a lot to come. Oh, yeah. Uh, hey, when we come back, you've heard of firefighters rescuing a cat from a tree? I was thinking how to grab it and how not to harm it. This rescue, a little different. It's next in our moment. These Ontario firefighters are used to emergencies, of course, but they did not know what they were getting into when they got a recent call to a spot near Western University in London. It wasn't a fire, wasn't a human emergency, but a deer stuck until they got to work. The rescue is our moment. We were walking by King's campus and we saw this deer, like a mother deer. As we got closer, we kind of heard rustling in the trench and sure enough, there was a baby deer that was trapped down there. We we're gonna try and sort of build like a ladder that it could climb up. That proved to be unsuccessful. So we ended up getting in touch with the animal rescue. Yeah, pretty good in the bag. The other scenario like fire, or the medical call, you trained for this, but not very much for a wild animal rescue. I was thinking how to grab it and how not to harm it. I have dogs all my life, but I never touched a little deer. He was so tiny and we were able just to take it and bring him up. 
sorry, baby, it's all right. It was really, really joyful moment. Oh, that noise. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I was so captivated by the video, I, I forgot that, uh, what I was going to say, <laughs> but simply that they were, you know, they talked about how they were going to build something to try to get the, the baby deer out. They went back home, they tried to get chairs and boxes, but, yeah, they just couldn't make it work. I have no idea if they're engineering <laughs> students, but it's yeah, Western, maybe. probably were. <laughs> that is a national for June the 2nd. Good night. Good night.